obviously. I have a special guest today. This is Chris Gagne. And uh, Chris is an experienced Agile coach, senior product leader, and meditation teacher in San Francisco, California. He guides teams through the Agile transformation so that they can complete twice the work with twice the joy in half the time. He also designs, develops, and ships innovative products that delight customers, create value, and do good in the world. Welcome to the show, Chris. Thanks, Adolfo. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. So one of the biggest jobs for a product owner is to say no. Tell me how often you've said no and to what title, for example, a CEO, VP, or some other, and how you did it, and what was the outcome? Indeed. Well, I somewhat disagree that saying no is the biggest job for a product owner. This doesn't mean that a product owner should ever blindly say yes, but rather that we need to look at the product owner's core objective and choose the best way of accomplishing that, which isn't always done by saying no. In fact, I'm having a hard time thinking of my career where simply saying no would have been the correct approach. It's important to understand everyone's responsibilities to set the context for this conversation. It's a product owner's job to maximize value delivery by effectively building the correct product. The two parts of this are effective and correct product. Right. Having the team oscillate between multiple different priorities at once or overworking is ineffective. It creates waste due to context switching, a form of Muda waste, and overburden, Murray waste. Working in multiple things at once also delays value delivery. Building the wrong thing is a form of overproduction as well, another example of murder waste. Mm -hmm. One of the companies I used to work for had a propaganda style posters that exclaimed, waste is anything the customer doesn't want and isn't willing to pay for. <laughs> and so it's usually a leader's job on the other side to ensure that their teams are delivering a maximum return on investment. So the leader's objective and the product owner's objective are actually really quite complementary. And often a leader will come to a product owner with a request because they believe it's going to deliver more value than whatever the product owner, whatever the team is working on now. And that's pretty reasonable. They sometimes have more information than the product owner about how solving this problem fits into the company's strategic vision, particularly in more complex environments with lots of interdependencies. And oftentimes they'll come to you because they don't understand the value of what you're working on. This means that you may not have been doing a good enough job selling your product and your backlog's value. And so it's important to understand where your leader is coming from. In larger organizations, like those with heavy command and control cultures, that leader might be doing their job just because they're a messenger of their manager's directive. For all we know, their bonus could be tied to getting a particular product out the door by a given date. Mm -hmm. It's important to emphasize with the person who's making the request. Uh, and this is because my favorite description of anger is the emotion that rises in response to a goal impeded. Yeah. And in the wrong culture, hearing no can create a lot of fear and anger. So, you're going to have a lot of these difficult conversations, and what you say is often less important than how you say it. Uh, I've really been a big fan of a book and a training course called Cruiser Conversations. They're designed to help you hold conversations where the stakes are high, opinions vary, and emotions run strong. And mm -hmm. clearly, we can see these conditions will be present virtually any time a product owner has to say no. And there's a lot of gems here, but do you have rapport? Can you create safety? Do you have shared purpose? Can you come to a solution together? Building trust with the leaders in advance will make all these conversations infinitely easier. So that's the context that all of this takes place in. Again, what you say is so much less important than how you say it. But you still need to say something. So it's valuable to talk to one another. The first words out of your mouth shouldn't be no, but rather, what problem would you like to solve? Yeah. Leaders often come to product owners with specific ideas or solutions in mind. And product owners are generally better than leaders in understanding what solutions are appropriate for a given problem statement. And let's face it, user experience folks are even better than product owners. Mm -hmm. And it may well be that the problem that the, leaders, the leader is looking to solve is either not really a problem or better solved another way. So you might not need to say no after all. I like that. I like how you tied in the user experience individual as well as uh, the trust topic and what problem you uh, uh, would you like to solve. Yeah. Indeed, it's, it's, it's hugely important. Um, I think we lose sight of why we're shipping software, right? We're not creating software just for the sake of creating software. We're creating software to solve our users' problems and deliver value. So oftentimes when folks come to us with requests, it's really easier for them to always have a, have a solution in mind. And this is really an opportunity to kind of take a step back and without saying no, really try to get at that problem and do something else with it instead. Uh, can you share some of the techniques and approaches you convey 
uh, used to convey the message that uh, something is not possible or potentially not possible? Yeah. Well, first, I think things are rarely not possible. Mm -hmm. um, many people thought that landing a person on the moon was impossible. <laughs> and uh, John F. Kennedy was credited with asking the people who said it couldn't happen with making it happen. It can be challenging, but there's a real growth mindset in asking yourself, what would it take to make this possible? And so just because something is possible doesn't mean it should be done, or at least not right now. And so figuring out that no versus the not yet is important. Saying no puts up much more of a barrier to a leader's goal progression than saying not yet. Sometimes it's worth taking the problem statement back to the team for their perspective as well. Sometimes it's worth declining or deferring a solutioning discussion because the problem isn't even worth solving yet. Mm -hmm. And so if your answer is not yet, this is a prioritization discussion. Your leader might want it right now. And so you have to ask, can you justify why this is worth interrupting work and process at a cost of not only deferring that work, but realistically losing most, if not all of the progress that has been made so far? Hmm. If you can avoid this, you've already done a great job of defending your team. Either way, this is a matter of what would you be willing to delay or give up so that I can deliver this for you? And if the answer is nothing, you don't have the rapport with your leadership or the corporate culture to do your job well. And I think the last thing I want to say about this is if you wish to say that something is impossible, you really got to be sure that your team agrees with you. And one of the ways that you can do that is by running a spike to run some investigative research with your team. But again, it all depends on your rapport, your culture, and your ability to articulate why something is impossible. So the emphasis, again, rapport being so important, defending the team, it's wonderful go-to tactics that people can consider and uh, execute with. Indeed. Well, thank you, Chris. Thanks, Adolfo.